Welcome along to the final vodcast in our lockdown series sponsored by Green King. A big thanks to everyone at Green King who made this series possible. Today, we're talking to three former players who've made a successful transition into other areas of the game. Warren Hegg, Martin Saggers and Steve Elworthy were terrific servants for their domestic teams and each had a fleeting taste of the highest level, playing two, three and four tests respectively. Steve also played 39 one-day internationals for South Africa. Warren is now Business Development Manager at Lanx. Martin has graduated to the international panel of the ICC umpires. And Steve, having overseen a hugely successful World Cup when at the ICC, amongst other events, is now the ECB's Director of Events, where he has introduced us to concepts like biosecure environments and bubbles. Gentlemen, good to see you all. Um, Steve, firstly, huge congratulations on, on getting this test series uh, against the West Indies up and running. At one stage earlier in the year, I'm guessing it, it, um, it looked like we might get no cricket at all. Just how big an undertaking has it been? Yeah, it's, um, you're right, actually. Come to think about it in March, we, uh, there was, it was on the cards that possibly we, we, there, there would be no cricket this summer. So, um, you know, when you start thinking about that as, a, as, a, as, an, as, as an option, uh, it suddenly becomes quite quickly, it becomes quite clear that it's not an option. We need to try and find a solution for it. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been a really, really intense couple of months. It's been unbelievable, but it's just been one of the most fascinating things I've been involved with. You know, I think there's, as you say, World Cups and, and what have you are, are, are you, you can learn from other global tournaments, you know, and you can, you can put your own stamp on it. And you've obviously got, it's played in, it was played in the UK here. And you take a lot of learnings from different countries around the world. But doing this for a first time is, you know, every single thing we did was a first in terms of everything you've did. So you effectively unpack an entire game of cricket and you put it back together again with sort of a medical biosecured lens on top of it. So yeah, it's, it's been challenging, but it's been, up to, it's been incredibly rewarding because I think now sitting back and we're in the, into the middle of the third test, um, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hugely rewarding. So, so very happy we, we're actually there and watching some international cricket. Warren Hegg, Manchester man, knows all about Old Trafford and the, and the weather. We won't ask you for a prediction because the test will be all finished by the time it's gone out, Warren. But just how difficult has it been being a kind of commercial man at, at Lancashire and seeing the ground empty, no hospitality, and just how big a hit has the county taken during this pandemic? You know what, folks? Yeah, you, you bang on there. What you're saying, we just spoke just off air, didn't we, about how different it's been watching an international match at our home ground uh, and not being able to be there to, to witness the, the spectacle. It's, you were used to you know, 20 odd thousand there, the hospitality suites full, the hotel suites all full, um, people having a great time, lots of noise, lots of excitement. And, and having to watch it from the, you know, from uh, from your own living room, really. Obviously not today, because at the time of uh, recording, it's been lashing down in Manchester. But it's been been really strange. But just what uh, Shotzi says there, it's uh, it's been an amazing um, experience being part of the, the backup staff to to put on that bio uh, biosecure test match at your own ground and from all. All um, stories that have come back, it's been a, it's been amazing and run really smooth. Just how big a hit though does the does the county take from a commercial point of view? I mean, it's uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you guys put your players on on furlough. Was it just you and Surrey that, that didn't do that? So you've been, I guess, paying wages, perhaps slightly reduced wages, but that that must kind of take its toll somewhere along the line without being able to recoup the money. Uh, it must do, yeah, because like we mentioned, the hospitality suites. Uh, are empty. There's, there's no one there spending, you know, quite expensive fees to to watch Test match cricket these days. Uh, no one spending over the bar. No one spending in, in the concourse bars. No one at the, the souvenir suites. Uh, no one at the the concourse burger vans outside. So yeah, well, obviously financially, it's going to be a real big hit for uh, for not just us, but for all Test match venues around around the country really. And it's something that. We'll leave it to the powers that be on the financial side to try and make the, bu uh, the, the, the books balance at the end of the day. But, yeah, we're hoping that 2021 brings a, a totally different scene to, uh, to, to Test Match Cricket and, and everyone's back enjoying what they, uh, what they do. Yeah, fingers crossed for that. Sags, you're in a, in a, a bubble down at the uh, Aegeus 
bowl and of course no hospitality or, or anything there but of course there is the golf course so I presume you've been walking out as you usually do on loads of golf balls so that's probably keeping uh, keeping Hampshire afloat um, but, but how have you how have you found it down there do you, do you get a sense from the, the England Ireland players that just everyone's just kind of ready to to, to get cracking yeah absolutely I think um once, once you get out in the middle and the games get started, it's just like any other game. You almost forget about the fact that there's no crowd there. And you just get on with the game of cricket. Um, and I, I have to say massive credit to Steve and the ECB staff and not just that, the hotel staff, but everybody involved in the biosecure bubble. Um, we're, we're very well looked after here. We've got all the facilities we need. Um, and the games that we're, I've, I've done, uh, I, I was in Derby for a week beforehand. And everything was secure there, the security and everything was set up perfectly. So I was with Pakistan doing a four day warm up game there. And I've, we've had three warm up games here and everything's run really, really smoothly. And the, all the teams have bought into it. They understand the situation and, and the, the, the way the world is at the moment. You know, you have to, you know, comply with these sort of things. So it's everything's going really well. And I think, you know, the test matches have gone on really well. And we just hope that that's all going to continue on for these, these ODIs, these upcoming ODIs. Have you had to re remind players that they, they can't put any saliva on the ball or, or does everyone really know kind of what they're doing? I mean, we, I, my kids play a bit of club cricket and they've had to, they've, we've sanitised the ball every six overs, hands have been washed. I presume because the players are getting tested, it's slightly different at uh, the level that you're, you're operating, but the, the players are very conscious of it. Does it look any different? Absolutely. Uh, you do get the players, just natural instincts, when they're about to start their over, they, they're passing the cap to you as an umpire. And you just got to say, I'm sorry, I can't take that. And they go, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. You know, it's, it's, it's all fine. And they, there's been no issues at all with saliva on the ball. Um, if, if it happens, you know, it's, it's generally purely a mistake and an error. Um, so you just, if, if, if it's going to happen, like happened in the test match, you just sanitise the ball and then move on. And, and then get on with the next delivery. But yeah, the players have been great. Um, so I think, I think they're just keen to have that competitive cricket starting up. Steve, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, the World Cups and the, the, all the, the ICC trophies, that, games that you've kind of look, looked after and that you can learn from previous tournaments. But to, to some extent, I guess, tournaments of that scale, whilst this is a unique situation, it, 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 some of those skills that you, that you learned or picked up must have stood you in good stead for, for, for this situation. Yeah, they did, uh, without a shadow of doubt. And I think that's what we had, you know, it's what you rely on. Um, you rely on a huge amount of experience. And I think we, you know, we had a really talented bunch of uh, individuals. We had quite a few of them stick around after the World Cup um, and stay um, on at the ECB um, to deliver this summer. So, you know, I think that experience that we've been able to draw on um, has been hugely beneficial. But, you know, they, they, they do come with a, as you say, it, it's, a, it's a slightly different set of challenges. It's not, you know, it's still at the end of the day, you've still got to put it on a game of cricket. Um, and you've still got broadcast and you've still got a whole, all the, everything that we know about a game of cricket is still got to be put on, except you just don't have, um, you don't have either 15, 17, 20, 25,000 spectators in the, in, the, in the bowl. So, um, you know, I think all of those elements are, are still are still, are still uh, areas which you, you've got to deliver. Um, and taking people out of it does make it slightly easier. But, you know, I think the way we've learned about the, the pandemic and we've seen how it's moved around the world, and I think Sags makes a really good point there because, you know, without, without the cooperation and the fantastic effort that the West Indies put in by getting on the plane and coming across here, you know, from effectively what, is, what was a COVID-free country, uh, coming into the UK for that was a, was a massive statement and a massive step. Um, and as I said, we've got Pakistan warming up and training in, down in Derby, and we've got uh, the Irish team uh, down at the Aegis Bowl ready for their, their ODI series. So I think the players have got to take a huge credit here for, for actually getting on the plane and getting these, these uh, matches away. Yeah, thanks to all those international teams. Uh, Peggy, there'll be players watching this, hopefully there'll be people watching this, um, thinking about careers after cricket, after their, their playing days have, have finished. I mean, when, when you were coming towards the end of your career, did you, was the, the Lancashire commercial department, you know, the, the business development side of things, always something you were going to go into? Or were you like a lot of players thinking, crikey, you know, what's next? 
It's really good point, uh, folks, and, and it was something that, that I stumbled over, really. I, I took a couple of courses with the PCA. I did a sales and marketing course. Uh, I also did a public speaking course uh, two years out from finishing my career, um, thinking that what am I going to do next? I've got to start planning for, for a future after cricket, uh, and, and that seemed the, the, the most sensible thing to do a long career at a county club met so many people so many business people so many supporters so many members so many fans uh, so the databases that i had over 20 years grew and grew and grew um, and a, and a um an opportunity came uh, came uh, along in the, in the hospitality section at, at, uh, at old trafford at lancashire cricket and it was something that that i just seemed to drop drop into really a former captain as you mentioned lucky enough to play for England I was I was quite well known around the um, the Lancashire area and heading up a, a hospitality team um, was was the next step really to to find in the next uh, next rung of the ladder really and, and it's something that I always try to, uh, to to recommend to our to our young players in particular to meet as many people as you possibly can along the, the the grind of what seems like the county championship. You know, we've all done it before that you've fielded for six hours uh, and you feel tired and you feel you feel worn out. But that uh, that half hour in the in the sponsors tent in the in the members bar, you know, chewing the fat, talking about the game. You never know who you'll meet. Uh, and that that for me was a was a real big fillip into into taking the next step into in a career after cricket. Yeah, Stags, you're qualified qualified architect, if I remember. Why umpiring, and uh, and not uh, kind of building stuff? <laughs> well, yeah, my story is a little bit different because I came into the game relatively late. I was 24 when I signed my first contract um, for Durham. Um, but before that, I went to university and studied architecture and got my degree. Um, but then obviously cricket took over and I, had a, a, you know, I was very lucky to have a good career in cricket um, and enjoyed that while I was playing. But um, I think while I was playing, it was sort of, I just wanted to stay involved and be within the game still. And coaching wasn't for me. Um, I, I, I do a little bit of coaching along the, the sidelines, a little bit of bowling coaching. But um, I don't know, umpiring, I spoke to the umpires. I was, I was always nice and kind to the umpires because obviously I needed them to give me some more wickets. Um, Ray Julian was a very good friend, I must say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a good friend to all fast bowlers. Um, so I was speaking to, I think it was Jeremy Lloyds um, back in 2002, 2003. And that's when I sort of thought, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go along. And the PCA put on a, an umpiring course, which I went to and... Um, I was with uh, Steve O'Shaughnessy and David Milnes, who have also become umpires. So I did the course with them, did my level one and through to my level three whilst I was playing. And then once I finished playing, it was almost a, a I knew my career had finished. You know, my body was, was tired, worn and knackered. So I had to move on. And, and it was an easy transition because I was still involved in the game. I understood the game. And it was then just really learning the laws intricately so that you can apply them on the field of play and to, to be involved in the game day in day out you know throughout the summers every year is is, is just it's great and as, as Warren says the people you meet not just the players but you know afterwards you, you go for a drink and you do still mix with the members and former players and it, it's just great to be involved in the game. Yeah, you mentioned Ray Julian as, a, as an opening batsman. You, you drive into the ground at Kent and the cars would be facing you. Do you remember how he had that Ray 4 LBW was his, was his number plate? And I could see all the bowlers kind of skipping along and doing cartwheels and the batter's heart would sink. Not that Ray wasn't a, a very lovely man, but you just thought, oh God, I'd take a guard three inches outside leg stump this guy. He? Well, he always used to say to me, folks, he always used to say, he used to say, Chucky, remember... The line is always yours, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, the heart would sink as a batter, I tell you. Um, yeah. Steve, what was what was that transition like for you when you when you finished playing? Was it? I'm trying to think where you finished up. Was it South? Was it South Africa? Were you playing county cricket when you decided? You know, this is this is my next move. How easy was it to to move into the admin side of the game? Yeah, a little bit of both of what um, of what Chucky and and um, Suggs have said there. I've I've had a little bit of 
uh, both of those areas, and I think both of them are absolutely valid. I, I, I study electrical engineering, and I became very, it became very apparent to me very quickly um, that that was a waste of three and a half years of studying. <laughs> but it was something that I uh, I certainly didn't want to pursue. Um, and um, and and I, obviously we did, you, you did it while I was I was still playing. Um, I then through relationships, as as Warren has said there, you know, I think I started forming relationships as you do after the game. You go to speak to people, and I, I formed a really strong bond um, with the head of sponsorships of South African breweries, funnily enough, um, who were a major sponsor at the time, and Standard Bank were also a huge sponsor of ours. Um, and they ended up having some really good conversations with both of them and understanding the commercial world um, a lot more around what it made it, it, what, what made cricket tick really in the sponsorship in the sponsorship area. Um, also played with uh, uh, an individual by the name of which I'm, a few people may know, Entius Patel, um, who's head of um, who's head of Supersport um, now in South Africa. Um, we played at university together, so you know there, I had a few sort of links there, and I think it really, from my perspective, I sort of thought this is it. The, the one thing that I was really clear about, though, it's just like it said, there's. I, I didn't want to go coaching. Uh, I just felt I'd spent so much time away from home um, with the playing and traveling all over the world that I felt if you were a coach, you, you probably, you, you're going to have to that same time commitment. Um, and I felt that the family had made a huge sacrifice in the time that I was away. So I certainly thought it was something that I needed to do. And I studied a, a marketing degree part-time um, while I was playing. Um, and then a role came up at Cricket South Africa in the sponsorship department um, and that was to the back end of my career I was just about to sign a new two-year deal um, and I decided not to um, I retired in 2003 the World Cricket World Cup was in South Africa in 2003 um, I didn't make the final 15 in that squad so I decided that was it um, and I will go for that and I went ended up in sponsorship um, and within a couple of months I was in the I was the commercial director he had left and then the next thing, one thing led to another and, and away you go. But it's amazing how that, that one door opened, you step through it. And, you know, 12 years I've been now living in the UK, um, having delivered, I think, around about seven or eight global tournaments. So it's amazing how quickly that happens. But, yeah, it was a, I, I realized quite quickly that um, I wanted to stay in cricket. Um, and I just think, you know, to be in the administration and be involved in the game still is a massive positive. And I, I, yeah, I think you know, it's incredibly privileged to, to have played and still be in it. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrific resume. But Heggy, I'm, I'm, as, the, as you've all been talking, I've been thinking about the kind of modern day cricketer because we would have played in an era where perhaps contracts weren't always 12 months. And, and certainly you, you had the opportunity in the winters to, to either go abroad and play, which a lot of them still do, or to find work um, either in businesses or with companies that perhaps are associated with the club. Just, just how big a challenge is it for players now to start working those contacts or to get a foot in the door given you know we are very cricket 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 as professional players yeah very much so and, and what we try to do at, at lancashire cricket folks is, is 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 with the sponsors that are involved with the club at old trafford as shotzi says you know we, we we're used to dealing with with brands such um such as emirates who who uh, and the hotel we've got so we've got lots of opportunities for players to get into different areas uh, quite easily and use the contacts that we've got at, the, at our, our local sponsors to give to give players who, who are thinking about the next uh, the next step of their lives uh, an opportunity to learn about a business. Uh, so we are we are quite proactive in that fact of, of making opportunities available to to all the lads. Um, you, you know, Sag said that that, that cricket and coaching um, and, and into the media is not for everyone after the game and there are only so many so many jobs there but there are opportunities for in particular for players who've played a long time at a county who've got maybe a good name in and around the traps around that to to get involved in the, the administration of of the county clubs and in hospitality is one in, in, in particular that, that that for me is 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 um is an easy sell for them to, to get involved with I would advise that to learn as many strings to your bow as possible of how, how your cricket club runs, whether it's hospitality, whether it's uh, signage and advertising, whether it's sponsorship, whether it's the, the finances. Because as players, and we've all been there, we turn up to the dressing room out of the county coach, we're on into the dressing room, aren't we? On into the green stuff, 
play our game into the dressing room, onto the coach. In a way, we don't see, see the infrastructure that goes on to run a cricket club. You know, Steve's seen it all. He's, he's been in the back rooms and, uh, and and I've been lucky enough to, to learn a new a new string to my bow and, and look and learning how crickets how crickets run and it's been really really interesting and of course extremely re rewarding. Yeah, Sags. Next steps for you because you're you're just onto this international panel. How I'm trying to think how long you've been umpiring now, but it seems like you've made that um, that progression quite quickly. Is I suppose the next the, the step is to to umpire well. And then try and get an elite panel. Do you look at it in that way? Do you do you goal set like I know you used to do when you played when you wanted 150 wickets a year and everything else? <laughs> 150 runs would be good, actually. Um, I think you've 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 got to take things stage at a time. I mean, I've, it's it's all well and good just saying you know, as a, as a player you want to say oh, I want to play Test cricket, but there's there's certain goals you've got to set yourself along the way. Um, I've been umpiring now. Um, on the first class panel for eight years. Uh, this is my ninth year. And yeah, I think I've just got on and, and I'm just thinking about, to be honest, the next three games that I've got coming up um, this week um, that start on Thursday. Um, so I, I want to just make sure that those games go well. Uh, like you do as a player, you want to make sure you've scored a 50 or a 100. You want to make sure you get five wickets or not get tonked around, you know, naught for a 100 or something like that. So you've got to take each game as it comes. And if you're doing well, then obviously things will, will progress afterwards. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I would absolutely love to, to, to experience umpiring at the highest level I can, which I, for me is a test match. Just like playing, I think a test match is the ultimate in, in playing. And it would be nice to be able to tick that box as as well as as played a test match. I'd love to have to have umpired a test match at the end of my umpiring career. Yeah, we wish you well with that. I, I still always think that umpires could, you know, a new celebration is is the key. I mean, we've we've seen we've seen the kind of that one from the Palmers, and we've seen what Barry Duddleston used to go and Gunner brought it up like that. I'm thinking that you know, if you do good a test match, I want to see full sags, John Travolta. Giving it out in some sort of style. That's that. That would. That would. Uh, I'd love to see that. So it's your Mobot Sags. That is your challenge, sir. Well, uh, I think as we all know, if uh, if you don't notice the umpire, then he's had a good game. So you, you're going to be waiting a long time before you see anything <laughs> like that. Don't you? Disappoint me yet again, Steve. Um, we, we're running out of time, but I mean. <laughs> Given we've come so far in, in, in this summer, county cricket is just about to kind of kick in. Obviously, we've seen the 100 be postponed to, to next year. We've seen the World T20 similarly postponed to next year, which means there's going to be kind of two tournaments in, in two years. What are the, the, the kind of the big challenges fa facing the world game? And, 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 and what do we have to do? Putting your kind of ICC hat back on, what, what, what's, what are the steps that the game has to take just to make sure everything is okay? Yeah, I think, I think there's, um, there's there's a lot that the game needs to uh, needs to think about. Uh, clearly, this the, the pandemic has has thrown it open uh, opened it wide. You know, um, never mind the, the future tours program, the qualification for the World Test Championship, um, the reorganisation of some of the global tournaments, um, and I think you know a lot of a lot of people have said it in the past, and I'm I'm, I'm quoting other people who've said this. You know, but often a crisis like this, you should never waste it. And I think there's a, there, there is certainly some sort of, there, there is some truth in that. I think we've really got to give it a, you know, you really got to give the game a, a, a really good look. I think people have been speaking about the game for years, about what potentially um, it should look like, what we should be thinking about the game, how it should be structured, how it should be played, how many formats, all those sorts of questions. Um, and I really think that we, we've, we've actually got the opportunity now to, to have a look at that. Um, and I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges, and I know say so we're learning from each other um, around the world, but, you know, one of the biggest challenges is to get back, I suppose, a lot of consumer confidence um, and being able to get fans back into the grounds. I think that's got to be the, the first challenge. Or well, one, one of the first is one of the biggest challenges. You know, I think we're coming through a summer um, where everybody else around the world is winter. Um, so they are coming up to their pre-season and into their summers. So it'll be interesting to see what that looks like around the world, whether or not they are still playing, um, as we've seen spikes happening in different countries around the world, whether they are still playing behind closed doors um, and, and getting the game on, but without fans. 
Um, and I certainly think some of the pilots that have been run um, over the course of the last couple of days um, with, with Surrey and now up at Edgbaston over the next few days, I think are critical elements to getting some of that consumer confidence back because you know, 2021 is, a, is another huge summer um, and we, we, we want to make sure that we have uh, crowds and capacity crowds come 21 because I think it could be quite devastating for cricket if, if that doesn't happen. So yeah, it's, 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 it's got a few challenges, but I think there's opportunity now to really have a look at some of those challenges. Yeah, well said. And gents, on that note, uh, we're going to leave it there. Warren Hegg, thank you very much for your time. Wish you uh, all the best uh, to get things back up and running in a normal fashion at, uh, at Old Trafford. And uh, keep up all the good work. Thanks. Good luck in the England Island uh, one dayers. And uh, to Steve Elworthy, many congratulations on everything you've achieved so far this summer, just to see any cricket at all. And I look forward to catching up, hopefully on a boundary edge uh, before too long. Of course, a huge thanks uh, to Green King for their support of the Lockdown Vogue cast series. Hopefully see you soon.